In the beginning, there was only one will, God's. Then Satan fell, and there became two wills. Then God created man with free wills. In the end, after Satan is destroyed, there will again be only one will. But not like God's will in the beginning, for it will be God's will and man's will perfectly blended into one will. My friends, that is what God is working to do right now. He is working to blend our will into his. He is working to align us as carefully and as powerfully as possible to his perfect way. We talk a lot about surrender, but we often don't say a lot about it. What really is surrender? How does it work? What does it look like? How can we become surrendered? How can we know that we're surrendered? How can we stay that way once we get there? All these questions about surrender that we don't often learn about. Let's look at some of these questions this morning. Even defining surrender can be difficult. Have you ever noticed that? One of my favorite definitions of surrender comes from the story of Charles Finney, who was a noted revivalist. He was standing at the door of the church as people were filing out after revival meeting, and a man came up to him and handed him a piece of paper. And later on, as he looked at this piece of paper, he realized that it was a legal document. It was a stop claim deed. And what the man had done, he had filled out this form and had stopped claim to his life in favor of Christ. He had relinquished all claim to his life, to his possessions, to his choices, to everything in favor of Christ, legally. Kind of a neat way of thinking, isn't it? Another one of my favorite definitions is drowning in the will of the Almighty. I like that definition because it, it's hard to drown. It's unpleasant to drown. But that's where we need to be. We need to be fully drowned in the will of the Almighty so that there is not one little bubble of self still in us. Another one of my favorite definitions for surrender is getting out of God's way so that God can be Almighty God in me. Because of our power of choice, because of our free will, we can stop God as he tries to bless us. But surrender says, no, I'm going to give myself wholly to Christ. Let him be almighty God in me. Perhaps a more complete definition of surrender is this one. Surrender is a spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled, settled commitment to give God all my choices in every area of my life, all the time. Surrender is a spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled, settled commitment to give God all my choices in every area of my life all the time. I like this definition because it highlights some very important things about surrender. One is only God can do it, only we can let him, right? It is spirit-inspired and spirit-enabled. The second thing I like about this definition is that surrender is a settled commitment. It's not something that we, we do during an emotional high and then a few hours later we kind of forget about what we said. In fact, surrender is best done when we are stone-cold sober emotionally. When we go into it knowing exactly what we're getting ourselves into, and we're willing to do it. It also talks about, this definition also talks about our choices, because surrender is all about choices, giving God all of our choices. And in every area of our life, we don't hold back even the smallest one, not even in the smallest area of our life, and not just here and there, but all the time. Surrender is a spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled, settled commitment to give God all my choices in every area of my life all the time. And because it's a settled commitment, it doesn't come easily and go easily. It's hard fought, hard won, but when it comes, it stays around. Surrender is drowning in the will of the Almighty. This is our key phrase this morning. It is a spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled, settled commitment to give God every choice in every area of my life all the time. Let's say that together, shall we? Surrender is drowning in the will of the Almighty. It is a spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled, settled commitment to give God every choice in every area of my life all the time. One reason that uh, surrender can be kind of difficult to define sometimes is that surrender is both an event and it's a process. It's an event in that there comes a point in our life where God brings us to the point where we are willing and able to commit all of our choices to him. That is a hard-fought, hard-won choice that we have to make. But it is also a process because each day we have to recommit to that. We daily take up our cross 
Daily we are learning new areas in our lives that need to be surrendered. Daily we are giving those new things to God. Daily we are recommitting to Him. It's, a, it's both an event and a process. If anyone wishes to come after me, Jesus says, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. A good illustration of surrender is marriage. Marriage is also an event and a process. The event of, of marriage is the ceremony where we get up in, together in front of the church and we commit ourselves to each other until death do us part. That's the event, but most people who've been married realize that that's not necessarily even the hard part of marriage, right? The process of marriage comes after that. The process where you learn about each other, where you learn to work together, where you learn how to please each other and how to work together effectively as a team, that's an important part of the marriage process. But my friends, neither marriage nor surrender are a process in the sense that we commit adultery less and less. Let me say that again. Neither marriage nor surrender is a process in the sense that we commit adultery less and less. In other words, if I stood up the, at the altar with my bride-to-be and I says, Honey, I, I commit myself to you 80%. How well would that go over? Any woman worth marrying would find the nearest exit, right? And would it do any good if I called after, Oh, honey, no, okay, 90%, 90%. Would that work? Will that help? No. It's 100%. It's all or nothing. It's the same with the Christian life. We cannot knowingly hold back even one choice. We cannot say to the Lord, Lord, I know that this is the bad choice, but I, I like it so much. I'm just going to hold on to this for a little while. That's okay. That's not what surrender is about. The Bible says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. What part of this verse is an event and what part of it is a process? Cease to do evil. Stop. That's the event. Learn. That's the process to do good. At every stage of development, we are told, our life may be perfect. Yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be what? Continual advancement. The process of becoming more and more wholly surrendered to Christ. Perhaps a parable can help us to understand this all or nothing surrender to Christ business. There was once this walled city that lived, that was situated at the bottom of this tall, long valley. It was a very fertile area. It was safe. There were no enemies around. They were very happy people, very nicely situated. The only problem with living here at this particular location was whenever it would rain farther up the valley, that rain would be funneled down the valley and it would come in and it would flood the city at the bottom. Well, this was a small price to pay and the citizens would get out the next day and they would just sweep away a little bit of dirt and they would be fine. That would be good. But the problem came when a little bit later on, other people began to discover this fertile valley and they began to build their own cities farther up the valley. And guess what happened then when it rained at the head of the valley? Because remember, in those days, their garbage dumps were stored outside the city walls. And so when this rain would come down and it would sluice through this valley, it would pick up these piles of putrid, filthy, rotting mess, and it would inundate that poor little city at the bottom of the valley with the stinky, filthy junk. Well, the first time this happened, the people came out of their homes and they were barely able to keep their breakfast down. It was so smelly. So they put the clothespins on their noses and they went to work. But to their horror, they were not able to clean up this mess. It just stuck to the surfaces like glue, like cement. It was impossible to get rid of. They tried everything. About this time, a traveling cleaner came to their, their city and talked to the mayor, and he says, hey, I think I can help you, and I'll do it for free. The mayor says, I doubt it, but hey, I can't beat the price. You're, willing to, you're um, free to try. Amazingly, this cleaner could clean up the mess. He got those sidewalks and houses sparkling clean again, miraculously. The problem came when he was about halfway through cleaning up the city, it rained again in the valley, up on the top of the valley. And once again, the floods came down and picked up all those garbage piles and, and piled them and inundated the city with that stinky, putrid mess. 
Well, the cleaner says, okay, I'll just start over again. So he did. Well, this happens several times before the mayor says, hey, you know, you know what, there's a problem here. No matter how much progress this great cleaner makes, we're always going to have this problem. So he got his wise men together and he said, let's have a council. Let's find out what we can do about this. We got this great cleaner, but he's not making a whole lot of progress because every time he starts making progress, the city gets flooded again. So they got together and after a couple hours of uh, mostly useless ideas, one guy stood up and says, hey, let's close the city gate. Let's close the one right in the front where all that flood water comes down. And the mayor said, brilliant, that, that'll do it. So the next day they got out uh, all their chains and their levers and their pulleys and they closed that gate. It was hard. They'd never closed that gate before. But they got it closed eventually and that solved all their problems. Well, actually, no, it didn't, because when it rained again and the floods came down, it just went through the other six gates. Hardly even noticed that one gate was closed. Well, they got together in council again and said, well, that didn't help a lot. What else can we do? So they said, let's close two other gates, the, first, the one in the middle and one on either side, and that way the rain will just go around us and we won't have any problems. So they did that. Didn't help. The flood swirled around and found its way through the back gates. Well, about this time, the citizens of the city were getting a little bit fed up with their leadership and saying, hey, we need a, problem, a solution to this problem. So they got together in one big convocation of all the city to try to brainstorm this problem. And after several hours of mostly useless ideas, a little child set up, stood up and says, let's close the last city gate. We've closed six of them. Let's close the last one. Well, after the laughter died down, the mayor said to the, the young man, I'm sorry that we laughed at you. We don't mean to be uh, so rude, but you can't close the last gate. How would we get in and out? Already this is a great inconvenience. It has affected our commerce and our ability to get in and out of our city. What would happen if we closed all the gates? We'd have to build ramps over the walls. What would people think about us when they saw this city with all the ramps over the walls? We can't do that. In fact, the mayor said, all of this closing gates has done nothing but cause us inconvenience. It hasn't done any good. I propose we open up the gates again. So that's what they did. The next day, they got out there with all their crowbars and all their pulleys and all their levers, but they didn't need them because it turns out that opening a city gate is really easy. Closing one is very hard. A few weeks later, the mayor called the cleaner into his office and he says, you know what, we really appreciate what you've done for us. You are a miraculous cleaner, but we really can't make any progress because the floods keep on coming, and so we're not going to need your services anymore. And besides, it doesn't really smell that bad after all. My friends, those open gates represent poor choices in our lives. Every poor choice in our lives that we know about, that we are making, is an opening for the devil to come in and undo much of the good work that God is trying to do in our lives. Lukewarm Christianity is all about giving God much of our choices, or even most of our choices. But what God is asking of us is all. Surrender is all or nothing. This almost wholehearted problem that we see in the world today is not just a modern problem. God fought it throughout history. In fact, do you remember reading in the Old Testament about the kings of Israel? You had the good kings and you did, had the bad kings. You know, this king did good in the sight of the Lord. This king did evil in the sight of the Lord. When I read those, I remember enjoying the good kings. But you know what? Even the good kings were not wholeheartedly committed to God. They had this little sin and this little sin is recorded in the book of Kings. The Bible says the sons of Israel did things secretly, which were not right against the Lord their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtown to fortified city. Now, this was a terrible sin because when God had instituted the sanctuary service, he had said, there's going to be one temple and you need to worship in this one place only. He told them, I do not want you to worship in your towns and cities and in your groves and high places. Because he did not want them to fall into idolatry like the people around them who had all of their, their idolatrous high places. And yet, they fell into this problem. They said to themselves, you know, it's such an inconvenience to go all the way to the temple. I could pray more. I could worship God more if it was just closer. And so they started to make these groves and high places. 
Jehoshaphat's an example of this. It says, Jehoshaphat walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. He did not turn aside from it, doing right in the sight of the Lord. However, oh, what a terrible word. However, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incenses on the high places. And it wasn't just Jehoshaphat. Jehoash did right in the sight of the Lord, only the high places were not taken away. Azariah did right in the sight of the Lord, only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places. Jotham did what was right in the sight of the Lord, only the high places were not taken away. Amaziah did right in the sight of the Lord, only the high places were not taken away. In all of these kings, there was a however, a but, an only. What an insidious word. But there was one king that did not have this word. And for our sake, I'm glad that we have this record. His name was Asa. Asa did good and right in the sight of the Lord, his God. For he removed the foreign altars and high places, tore down the sacred pillars, cut down the ashram, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord their, of their fathers, Lord God of their fathers, and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was undisturbed under him. Asa did good and right with a whole heart. The only king that we saw that did that of these kings. And the kingdom was undisturbed under him. Isn't that a great promise? God wants to bless us beyond our dreams. Now those blessings aren't always easy and comfortable, but they're always good. God wants to bless us if we would just let him by giving ourselves wholly to him. God is longing to bless us. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are what? Fully committed to Him. My friends, are our hearts fully committed to God? Can we say, like the psalmist, Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire what? Nothing on earth. Surrender is all or nothing. It's all or once, all at once. We don't close a city gate here and a city gate there and then a city gate there. We give God all of our choices in every area of our life all the time. Someone once made the startlingly obvious statement that a large canyon is not crossed by a series of small jumps. Can you just picture in your mind a man standing at the edge of this large canyon and say, okay, I'm going to do a series of small jumps to get past this canyon. And he makes the first small jump and what happens? It's all over. You don't cross canyons that way. And it's the same way with surrender. Surrender is a leap of faith. It is 100%, all or nothing, all at once. There are some who seem to be always seeking for the heavenly pearl, but they do not make an entire surrender of their wrong habits. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. Therefore, they do not find the precious pearl. They have not overcome unholy ambition and their love for worldly attractions. She goes on, they do not take up the cross and follow Christ in the path of self-denial and sacrifice. Almost Christians, she says, yet not fully Christians. They seem near the kingdom of heaven, but they cannot enter there. Almost, but not wholly saved, means to be not almost, but wholly lost. Almost, but not wholly saved, means to be not almost, but wholly lost. On February 1, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere over Texas and Louisiana. And the reason why it disintegrated was because during launch, 15 days before, a small chunk of foam had fallen off of the external booster tank and had struck the leading edge of the Space Shuttle and created a small hole. This happened 82 seconds after launch. And when the space shuttle was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, the, the compressed gases and the heat of re-entry was actually allowed to enter into that, that hole, and it became a blowtorch, essentially, and melted the wing from the inside. And the space shuttle disintegrated. The real tragedy is that NASA knew that these chunks of foam were falling off. It had happened four times before on four previous space shuttle flights, and yet they still kept doing it. And you'd think that NASA would learn their lesson because 17 years earlier, the space shuttle Challenger had been destroyed on takeoff, on launch, 
because of an O-ring problem. An O-ring problem that was a known problem that had happened several times on previous flights. And they said, well, you know, it's burning through a little bit, but it didn't burn all the way through, so we're okay. Until they weren't, until the O-ring did burn through all the way and the space shuttle was destroyed. A sociologist studying the Challenger explosion, the culture at NASA, coined this phrase, normalization of deviance. In other words, something was wrong. It was a deviation from the plan, but it hadn't caused any problem yet, so let's make it normal. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's normal until it's not. My friends, in our lukewarm way of thinking, these end times, we often also have this same normalization of deviance. We often say, you know, it's just a little thing. It's not that big of a deal, right? And yet, the truly surrendered life has to have every gate closed. Not the smallest one can be left open. The smallest crack will let the devil, the devil slither through and undo a lot of the good work that God is trying to do in us. Have we come, become nonchalant with our choices? Have we come to the point where we make choices not because we consider God's will, but because our peers do it and our parents do it and even our pastors may do it? My friends, there is no little bad choice in the surrendered life. We cannot fall into this normalization of deviance. That is what makes lukewarm Christianity. You know, we have sometimes become so unbalanced that when one of us, when God gets through to one of us and he finally realigns us to his true balance, that person looks unbalanced to us. But God is wanting to bring us back to his true balance. He's wanting us to realize that little bad things are not normal. They're not acceptable. They will destroy us. Someone has once said that if, if God is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And that is so true. Ellen White puts it this way. We do not belong to Christ unless we are his holy. Let none deceive themselves with the belief that they can become holy while willfully violating one of God's requirements. The commission of a known sin silences the witnessing voice of the Spirit, and separates the soul from God. My friends, if we want to delight in the Almighty, if we want that relationship with God to be strong, where we are close to Him, enjoying Him, delighting in Him, we can't let anything, anything silence God, separate us from God. We must give God all of our lives, all at once. It was this one misunderstanding of surrender, this normalization of deviance, that caused me spiritual poverty all my life. I thought it was okay. I thought it was normal to have bad problems. You know, I gave God my big problems, but these little things, you know, we'll work on these later. Well, I didn't realize was that until God got the little things, he was powerless to be able to give me victory over the big things. There is no such thing as a little bad choice in the Christian life. A seven-year-old boy whose name was ironically Christian once emailed Santa and he said, how bad can I be and still lose my presence? We smile at that, but do we say that same thing to God? Do we ask God, how much can I get away with? Or do we say, Lord, I want to give you my best choice in every decision that I make. Surrender is drowning in the will of the Almighty. It is a spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled, settled commitment to give God every choice in every area of my life all the time. Surrender is both an event and a process. We come to, God gets us to the place where we are willing and able to commit all of our choices to him. That's the event. It's a process in, in that God is continually showing us new areas of our life that needs to be surrendered. It's a process in that God is... is enabling us to see these new areas and enabling us, enabling us to continually give them to him. Surrender is all or nothing. It's all at once. It includes the little things, all the little things. My friends, do you want to be surrendered? If you haven't already experienced this all or nothing, all at once, giving to God of your choices, would you like to do that? 
Would you like for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in you and empty you of yourself and fill you with himself? You can have that experience right now. It's your choice. It's your choice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for surrender, the privilege of getting out of your way, of letting you be almighty God in us. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that you are willing and able to get us to the point where we commit all of our choices to you. And that you are willing and able to get us through the process of daily recommitting all of our choices to you in every area of our life. Father, I pray that you will help us to shun even the little bad choices. Anything that will in any way hinder our love relationship with you. We pray for these things. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.